Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks a lot again to Ben uh, and Oliver for the invitation uh, today. Um, so I'm going to continue speaking about Cayman. I don't know how many of you were at the session on Tuesday. Uh, I'm going to go fast over what calcium imaging that, uh, is and maybe go a little bit more into the detail of Cayman. So Cayman is a package for the analysis of calcium imaging data. Today, we're going to focus mostly on multi-photon imaging uh, data analysis. And if you guys want, you can start installing Cayman. Uh, if you want to install it in, in uh, Linux and Mac OS, it's uh, relatively straightforward. If you want to uh, do it on Windows, it's a little bit of a masochistic experience, uh, but you can still do it. Uh, all the instructions are at this link that I also paste in the chat, if you want to have a look at it. Uh, but basically what you do, you can just clone Cayman. Uh, this is the installation, not for developer, developers, just for using Cayman. Uh, you clone this, uh, the repository, you enter into the folder of the repository, of course, and then by running this command, you will create an environment automatically that is called Cayman and, and which contains a set of packages that are necessary for Cayman to work. It's called an environment.yml uh, file. Uh, you will activate your environments and then you will need to install uh, from within the directory uh, Cayman using pip install with this command. Uh, you actually don't need the E if you're not a, devel a developer, so you can just do pip install dot. Uh, you might have some issues with uh, if you're running on Mac, but I doubt since probably most of you have, uh, are developers, you probably have this already installed. Uh, in order to optimize performance, since you want to uh, set all the number of threads for any possible linear algebra library you have on your computer to one, so that processes don't interact uh, among, uh, with each other. And finally, with this command that is called kaimanmanager.py install, you install uh, an infrastructure that includes uh, the uh, demo, demos, demo files, uh, the movies that you might want to download, and they will set automatically some path. So please, uh, while I explain, you can start installing if you want. And this is the outline of the presentation. We will have a demonstration at the end. I'm going to introduce again a little bit of a motivation for Cayman. Then we are going to straight, uh, go straight to the meat of the problem. We're going to do, see how to do motion correction, memory mapping, uh, and, and then how to extract uh, spatial footprint and traces from calcium imaging movies. Then we are going to deal with uh, the integration with uh, neural data without border data format. Uh, and, and we'll see all of this on a demonstration at the end. So as I mentioned on Tuesday, uh, we have calcium imaging. The basic idea is that you can express the protein in cells uh, that is fluorescent. And the fluorescent of this fluorescence of this protein depends on how active a neuron is. So when you see one of these ring, rings becoming active, that means uh, be becoming bright, that means that the neuron become active. Okay, the big problem that we have uh, with calcium imaging data is being able to go from these movies to the spikes. Okay, and in order to do this, several operations are required that we detail in what follow. As I mentioned yesterday, there are two possible ways to go about it. One is a batch. So we are gonna have all of the movie in memory and the other one is online. Uh, we can do this for instance in real time as we want to do a closed loop experiment, frame by frame extract with the activity of neurons. Today, we are gonna focus on uh, the batch case. So we have all of the movie uh, available and um, we can store it on the hard drive. There are the most, most um, cellular brain imaging analysis uh, pipeline share a set of common operations. Uh, and in particular today, we're gonna see what memory mapping is. We might have data sets that are about 50, 100, 200 gigabytes that are in general larger than uh, a new PIP installer. Sorry, I see a, okay. So look, the PIP installer can work kind of okay. The main idea for the PIP installer that it's not officially supported. You know, I had to do it, but I had, you know, they didn't want it to support officially because it's a, you know, having two installers to support is a bit difficult, but uh, basically it was done to be used on the um, um, Colab notebooks. And it was working pretty nicely, even with some basic form of visual interface until uh, unfortunately that there was some incompatibility between um, Bokeh and uh, 
the Colab Notebook. But sure, you're welcome to use it also for Windows if it works well. In general, the big issue is to compile OpenCV. If there is a good uh, OpenCV, um, let's say, package is compiled in PIP, then you're good to go. But I'm happy that you can use it with PIP, definitely, Hendrik. Um, so I was mentioning, so we have uh, very large uh, movies, so we want to able, be able to handle them uh, without loading them into memory. We want to find where the neurons are. We want to be able to denoise, to separate the different components, the different neurons that might even overlap. Oh, this moved around, sorry. Um, like in, in this case, you see these neurons that uh, overlap uh, here. Uh, and then we want to extract the spikes and try to increase the signal to noise ratio as much as we can. Okay, let's go to the first uh, um, operation that is motion correction. Here you can see, you have a, uh, uh, if you look at the row movies, these are taken with a, a microscope that is positioned on the head of a mouse. And what happens is that the mouse uh, moves, runs, and we did the brain because it's a little bit of a mushy uh, medium. What you need to do is to be able to transform this, uh, to be able to map each of the pixel to always the same spatial position. To do so, you need to do, you perform a motion correction operation. That in this case, as you might notice, is a non-rigid transformation. That means it's not enough to apply a rigid transformation from this frame to obtain these frames. So we have an approximation of this uh, operation we basically tile the field of view with these little patches. We motion correct uh, each of them. And then uh, we uh, merge everything into this movie. On the right, you have a set of parameters that you want to use when you perform motion corrections. And in general, when running Kaiman. So uh, frame rate, uh, 30 Hertz in this case, the decay time is typical of uh, the indicator that you're using. They might be, for instance, in this case, GCAMP's 6F. This is their, their spatial resolution at X and Y per pixels. And this is the maximum shift that you uh, are uh, allowed, you will accept uh, in terms of uh, rigid motion. So for instance, you will not, you, uh, this is an estimate of the maximum that you, a shift that you will have in your brain. That in this case is 12 microns. And finally, we have the patch uh, size. So when we divide the field, the field of view in these patches, we want to know roughly what is the dimension. In our experience, uh, in general, it's not necessary to change these coordinates, uh, but uh, of course, if you see, for instance, that there is an area that is very dark uh, and there is not much structure that can be used to motion correct, then you want to increase this. And in this case, you have a trade-off between how elastic, how non rigid is your motion and how big are these uh, patches. You can, of course, choose to use motion corrections uh, rigid or non-rigid. When you use the piecewise rigid, uh, what happens is that it's uh, significantly slower, but more precise. So as usual, uh, uh, it, I think a, 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 a nice way to, prog uh, to, to go about it is to start with the rigid motion corrections. If it works well, you just stick to it. Otherwise, you try the piecewise rigid. Uh, in general, you don't want to change all these parameters. They are here. If you want, I can clarify what they mean. What's very important to understand is that this operation will create a memory map file. Memory map files are an infrastructure to perform operations directly on the data that is stored on the hard drive. So instead of, let's say, uh, loading memory, uh, 100 gigabytes of um, a movie, Maybe you say, I just want to, okay? And in this case, you can use a memory map uh, infrastructure. However, when you use this type of file format, you have to pay attention uh, the way you store the data on the hard drive. You might notice here there is F order. F order is uh, a, the way in which the file is stored on the hard drive in terms of ordering. Uh, this is a two dimensional uh, in, uh, structure, right? The matrix, and you cannot uh, save Two dimensional structure on the hard drive. So everything must be one dimensional. But the way you order the file is important. So meaning, do you want to store row by row or column by column? And depending on these parameters, that is the order, you will use one or the other. In particular, in this case, we save the data in such a way that is easy to read 
frame by frame. So you can take this file and very easily say take the first 1000 frames. How do we perform motion correction? There is uh, an efficient way of reading data sets. As we will see later, this also happens for the uh, NWB file. So we get the movie, we divide it in many chunks uh, in time, uh, and each of these chunks is sent to a different process that in parallel motion correct each of the chunk. The results of motion correction is both the movie corrected, but also a template. A template is a representation uh, of the ideal field of view. So a denoise version of your field of view. You will merge everything in a master template and then you can start again the operation iteratively as many times as you want. And generally just once is fine. So these are multiple advantages. First, we save time because we are uh, parallelizing. And second, we also save in space with, because in memory because we don't have to uh, load the full memory, the full movie in memory, but maybe we just need 100 or 200 frames for each of these chunks. Once we've done a motion, when it was with motion corrected, we uh, obtain a file that, as I told you, was in F order, okay? And <coughs> this is fantastic if you want to read frame by frame, but what if we want to just read a set of pixels? So for instance, give me just pixel one to pixel 10. If we try to read this from an F order file, it will be very inefficient. So we need to save this file in another format that is called C. In this case, also, we have uh, a set of routines that works in parallel. So it, again, the, the data set is not loaded in memory all at once and then saved, but different chunks of the files are read in parallel and saved at the same time. Once we've done this, we can uh, use this operation. It's called load memmap. And now we have available the full movie. It doesn't matter if it's 200, 300, 400 gigabytes. You have available the whole movie and you can read small uh, um, subset of pixels very easily. You, in, some, in some instances, you can also directly operate on these pixels without loading in memory. For instance, you can sum some of uh, all of this. You can multiply all of them. Uh, and of course, these are specific operations that are supported by NumPy. So I summarize this. We have two files, one that can be read easily frame-wise and one that is uh, easily readable pixel-wise. We will see why this is useful very soon. Now I'm gonna uh, start talking about uh, the analysis of calcium imaging data. Okay, I'll give you a little bit background about the machine learning model that we uh, rely on, and then uh, I'll explain how do we solve uh, this computational, in a computational efficient way. So the, the, the framework is called constrained non-negative matrix factorization, okay? And the idea is to represent the movie, the full movie, as the sum of different components that are neurons plus a background. And these components will have two types of, uh, uh, if you want, um, these components will have two a, a double nature. One is gonna be a special, uh, special feature, so there is their special footprint, and the other one, their temporal profile. And this is true both for the components of neurons that we call A and C, and for the background in Europe. In mathematical terms, what we are solving is these non-negative uh, matrix factorization problems in which we approximate Y with the sum of AC and BF. There are uh, some uh, features that are associated to these matrices. Uh, for instance, one is sparse. So the spatial components will be sparse. What does it mean sparse? It means that only few pixels in all this frame are gonna be non-zero. And the other important characteristics is that uh, they uh, all of the components will be non-negative because we don't expect to have photons are positive, of course. So uh, originally the problems is positive. And secondly, you know, the foot, special footprints and calcium activities are all positive. So we can add all this information into this problem and uh, solve it in a better way. This gives you a pictorial representation of what I mean. This is the original movie. This is the original movie. We uh, basically uh, flatten it up in starting from pixel by pixel uh, times frames. Now we have number of pixels in one direction, the number of frames, and we can uh, represent now this big matrix Y with the products of much smaller matrices that we represent neurons. And so basically in this direction, we have neurons. Indeed, one, <clears throat> if we take the outer product of one columns of this matrix A, 
and one row of this matrix C, what we obtain is this. We are able to reconstruct the contribution of a single neuron to the full movie. This is very useful because this type of uh, representation automatically enforces that there is a separation of the signals coming from overlapping neurons and the background. For the background, we have something similar. Also, if you look at the, uh, pro the outer product of matrix B and F, we'll reconstruct what is your background. And this is exactly what happens when you put everything together on the left, uh, the output of the algorithms, the spatial components, the temporal components that we call A and C. This is the raw movie, the original movie. This is the movie that is reconstructed using both the neurons and the background. And uh, here we have the movie that is constructed just using the neurons. And finally, here we have the residual that is this movie minus these movies. If we shouldn't see much structure here if we did a good job at capturing all the neurons that are present in this field of view. Hi, right, so uh, how do we do, uh, how do we perform this operation? Of course, this optimization problem is very, com is very um, it's not very easy to solve. Uh, it's non-convex uh, and it de strongly depends on the initialization conditions. But since we uh, have available a very efficient data format, in which we can access the data in multiple directions, what we can do now is parallelize the operations. We can take different portions of the movie and uh, on each of them operating a sort of initializations. Afterwards, we can put together the solution and then refine it using some quality criteria. Let's look at it in more detail. So we're gonna uh, look now at the initialization. We are if you think about solving the problem of finding neurons on the full field of view, and if you think about solving that very same problem, now looking at a small window, which contains a set of neurons, the problem is basically the same, as long as you are able to deal with what happens at the borders. And that's exactly the philosophy that we decide to use. We're gonna divide the field of view in patches. So we are gonna lower, we're gonna send to different processes, different tensors, the different tensors are these different colors. There are these uh, big chunks of the movie, either to local processors or to high performance clusters. It doesn't really uh, make a difference from the point of view of Kaiman. Uh, and after solving the problem, approximating the solution of the problem on each of these little square, we put together them and we merge the borders. The, um, you'll see later the uh, syntax, but uh, the parameters that you need to specify are this RF, that stands for resetted field, that is half of the length of this square, the stride, that is uh, the overlap in some sense, and K equal four, it means how many neurons you expect to find. So our approach is, since we don't know actually how many neurons are present, are present in our movie, we overshoot a little bit. Okay, we say at most we expect four. And then we try to find four in all of these patches, even if there are not four. And afterward, we clean up the results. Some, uh, we want to explain a little bit about the parameters because this can be useful for what you do uh, in your experiments every day. Uh, the parameter P is the order of the autoregressive system, is how do you perform deconvolutions. A P equal one represents the case of a, uh, slow indicators, uh, sorry, fast indicator and slow frame rate. Like for instance, if you take a 30 Hertz with a GCAMP 6F, that's a perfect uh, approximation. And instead, when you have um, a slower indicator and uh, faster uh, frame rates, then you want to use a P was equal to. What is the difference? What do you want to check if, is whether it will require just one frame for the calcium transients to reach the peak or more than one. So let's say that you have GCAM 6S, for instance, at 30 Hertz, and maybe you will need two or three frames before you reach the peak. In this case, you want to use P equal to. GNB is the number of background components. If you have a complex neuropil, you want to use a number of two or three. Don't exaggerate, otherwise you will start uh, englobating uh, neurons. Merge threshold is 
basically the correlation, the minimal correlations that is required before we take two neurons and we put them together into a single one. Because sometimes, of course, we take only chunks of neurons. RF, I already explained to you. G-sig is the half size of a neuron, uh, is the expected size. And I don't think you want to touch any of these uh, results. But just summarizing again, uh, P, you want to use P equal one, uh, P equal one unless you have a, a slow rise time. GNB, you want to use one or two, depending on how complex is your background. And merge threshold, 0 0.8. Uh, if you have neurons that are very correlated, for instance, if you are photostimulating neurons, then you might use 0 0.9 so that uh, you avoid the algorithm to start putting together neurons that are actually different neurons. So we saw how do we initialize the algorithms on different patches, what happens uh, when we put them together? We want to refine the solution using some quality criteria. So the criteria that we have uh, are three. One is uh, related to the signal to noise ratio of our calcium transients. We have a very robust way of estimating the noise level. And upon this noise level, we define probability distributions of over these peaks. And when these peaks become very, very unlikely, given this uh, noise level, then uh, we consider a trace of high quality. Basically, the highest transient, the highest transient in the cell, in the trace, decides the overall quality of this trace. So this parameter that we call mean SNR is exactly related to how big should be the largest transient. The second is spatial. We are checking how similar is a spatial component extracted to, uh, from the algorithms, extracted by the algorithms, with uh, the, the neuron that is in the field of view. To achieve this, we only average the frames in the movie during which the neuron is active. If we do this properly, we should have something dark all over the place except where the neuron is. And then we can cut a little corner here and then compute the correlation between these two. If the correlation is high, then it means that most likely we uh, got a neuron. Instead, if this is noise, the correlation by definition will be zero. And the threshold on the correlation, as you know, is between minus one and one, is this one, 0 0.85. The third criteria is based on convolutional networks. We trained a very simple convolutional network. Convolutional networks are a form of supervised learning. We trained this algorithm to recognize what looks like a neuron from what look like either a pancta or simply noise. After training these algorithms with about to one third of the data, then we test on the remaining data sets. And as you can see, the algorithm is very good at deciding what uh, looks like a neuron and what doesn't look like a neuron. Of course, these algorithms are, are very good if you use data sets that are similar to the one that you use for training. The farther you go in terms of similarity with the, with the, with the training, the, uh, the less performance we can obtain from this one. Sorry, there is a question about merge threshold. Hendrik, uh, the special, the merge threshold is checking the temporal correlation between traces that overlap in space. So if they have at least one pixel in common, we uh, check what is the correlation. And if the correlation is very high, then we merge, we merge them. Is that clear? I hope it is. Ah, thanks. Awesome. So um, you can define a probability that goes from zero to one that defines how likely is some mask, some spatial component to be a neuron. And this threshold is, uh, we have two thresholds for this, the what's called CN, CNN uh, TA, underscore THR. This, that is, if, if, the, um, if the component is at least 0 0.99, then we accept it for sure. And there is a, a lower threshold that we found to be very uh, efficient. That means that you are gonna reject every component. It doesn't matter 
it doesn't matter what the signal to noise ratio is, what the real uh, Erval threshold is, we're gonna reject every component that is not similar to a neurons to a probability of 0 0.1. Okay, so example of solution refinements, we start you know, with our touches, we merge everything together and you see that there is a lot of neurons uh, that they, they don't really like uh, real, a lot of components that don't look like real neurons. Then we pass our conditions and then you see automatically we are able to pick up most of the good neurons. As you will see later in the demo, it is also possible to further refine with a very basic uh, visual interface. Nothing uh, like what you saw from Biafra on Tuesday. That was um, masterly. Okay, so is everything clear uh, so far in terms of inner working of Kaiman to perform analysis of multi-photon imaging? And then there will be a demo, of course, so there will be also a chance to discuss more in details. You seem to be okay. Okay. I'm going to go on that. Okay, so uh, Kaiman has, has, has implemented a set of functions that uh, enable it to interact with bidirectional, with bidirectional with the neuro data without border file format. The first one that I want to talk about is saving. Although you can, of course, save uh, in neuro data without border format using other software packages. Uh, what we provide is a convenient utility in which you just load maybe your data in TIFF file, in TIFF format, HDF5, or MOV, and then you can save it in an NWB format and add some basic uh, information about the data. This is an example. Uh, you load uh, a data set that we call like F name origin, as you will see in the demo, and then you can express a set of uh, arguments to the save function that depending on the extension of the file, we use this different file format. You know, you can save in TIFF format, you can save in HDF5 format, you can save in AVI format. And the, if the extension is NWB, then you can add a set of uh, arguments. And these arguments will be automatically embedded into your NWB file. So this is very convenient because if Kaiman directly saves in NWB, since at the moment we don't have a convention, we're talk talking about before like uh, naming conventions for some fields, you know, you're sure that you'll be able to use. But you know, in the future, it would be very nice to have a centralized way of organizing these data, these, uh, these fields. So you save and you have an NWB file and Kaiman has been uh, modified to be able to also efficiently read in parallel uh, this, uh, the NWB file. So what I mentioned before, uh, which we, we divide the moving chunk can happen uh, now with the NWB format. Unfortunately, at this point, what we do is we need to create again our memory map formats. You know, it will be ideal in the future to be able to embed this type of files also into uh, NWB. At the moment, we stuck to them only because NumPy has very efficient routines to access uh, the data when you use that format in particular. I'm sure that in the future, we can also save some intermediate steps uh, of analysis in, uh, in NWB. Uh, in all honesty, uh, in general, you wouldn't use this much. So these intermediate files are just used to do the, the bulk of the computation, but you wouldn't then, you know, keep three, three copies of your movie on your hard drive forever. Of course, you're gonna erase it uh, earlier rather than later. So I, uh, I showed you how to load in TIFF, save in NWB file, and then use this for op optimized process. You can also save then the results of the analysis in NWB file. As we saw before, we have, of course, mask, masks, we have special footprints, we have traces, we have background. All of this can be saved in the NWB format, okay? Uh, the, the syntax is very easy. Uh, we have an estimates object that is the one that contains all the results of computation and you can call the save underscore NWB method with a save path. 
and uh, some information that it's uh, compulsory to uh, provide. Of course, you can add all the information that was also described here, here. But since this file already existed nicely because we, we, we created it here, now we don't have to repeat all that. We just pass the same file and we'll, uh, let's say, complement the existing NWB file with the results of the analysis. That's what you want to do. You don't want to you know, create a new file from the scratch every time. And uh, finally, once we have this NWB file, we, we, we have a very basic visual interface that uh, allows to uh, load the results, select a subset of traces that uh, we are happy with, uh, and then save them again in uh, NWB format. And then so if you want, you can load them again in the future. Importantly, you will be able to save these components now organized into accepted, rejected, or, you know, still not processed. Uh, so it gives you, in some sense, a little bit of flexibility. And you can read this directly from the NWB file. Now I am going to pass the screen to Chang Jia, that is uh, a graduate student that is going to show you how to run a demo. Uh, the, uh, Chang Jia, I'm going to show you, uh, maybe I will pass the uh, link to the demo on GitHub if they want to follow along. Uh, but, you know, I'm available to answer questions that you have in the group chat while uh, Chang Jia is, uh, is running the demo. Okay, so uh, next I will lead you guys through this demo. Uh, so I will focus on how to uh, load NWV file and save into NWV format and also show you guys the GUI. So, uh, first, what, what we get is a, a TIFF file. A TIFF file, and we can use the function in Kaiman to save it into an NWB file. So that's the saving. And I think Andrea has already talked pretty carefully about this. Next, we set up the motion correction and there are set several parameters for uh, doing motion correction. And before doing that, let's first check the movie. So this is a movie and, and you can see there's lots of movement Uh, we set set up a cluster. And we motion correct it. Uh, the movie itself is pretty small, so it, it won't take much time. You want to show the paralyzation? Is or it's done already? So so the parallelization step is this step. Uh, we, we set up a cluster and we can define how many processes uh, we want to use. And if you select uh, M processes to be none, that, that means you use the uh, number of your CPU minus one. So if I have 16 cores, then we use 15 for doing parallelization. So here we want to see the result of motion correction. And also, oh, I'm just. The left is the uh, raw movie, and the right is the uh, movie after motion correction. So, one parameter, like this parameter, needs to be noticed. That's whether you use piecewise rigid motion correction or you just use uh, a naive rigid motion correction. To motion correct this video, we use uh, piecewise rigid. So after motion correction, we save the movie into memory mapping format. Here we save it into the C format. So this step should be quick. And we restart the cluster 
to clean up the memory. So after that, uh, what we want is using Kaiman to do the source extraction and deconvolution. So for source extraction, our goal is to find the spatial footprint of neurons and also the signal of neurons. And in the deconvolution step, our goal is to find a denoised version of the signal using the autoregressive model. And these parameters, Andrea has already talked about it. So we'll just go. And so the motion correction, the big picture is that it has two steps. In the first step, it, it finds the spatial footprint and the signal, but in a pretty, not so carefully. And we do this step in patches. And after we find the roughly where the spatial footprint is, we do the second time of source extraction. And this time we refine the spatial footprint and the signal. So there are two steps. So here we do the first step of the source extraction. So it's really quick. And we show where the component is. So we can see that the, the result contains the neuron we want to find, but also it contains a not relevant spatial footprint. So what we want now is to refine the result we have. So we run it, uh, run it again. And it's done. Uh, after the source extraction and deconvolution, we set up metrics to measure how good the spatial footprint and the signal are based on the three metric. Uh, the signal to noise ratio of the signal, the correlation threshold, and the CNN. So uh, we run it. And we plot the, plot the counters after refinements. The left shows the components that pass, pass the matrix that has good spatial footprint and the signal. And the right is the rejected components. So we can see the neuron we want to select, mostly it's uh, inside the accepted components. Next, I uh, we want to see the see the spatial footprint, uh, spatial components, and and the the signal. So here there is a small problem that the deconvolution trace uh, looks like a straight line, but if you Enlarge this part, you will see. Uh, you, you you will see the deconvolution trace. It's just because the uh, the value he, value for the y-axis is too large, and we can switch across different components. And see if you like it. And we can compute the. Uh, DF or F. Uh, so for this step, it takes some time, and we can build a component to see the final trace. And finally, we want to see the reconstructed video. So the left is the uh, raw movie, the middle it's the uh, reconstructed one, and the right is the uh, 
residual moving. So we should see a clear spatial footprint in the middle and we should see uh, almost no components in the residual movie. Here we can save our results into NWB format. It's really easy. And next I can uh, show you guys the uh, GUI for selecting neurons. We can choose uh, the result to be HDF5 or just NWB. So here, uh, we see the GUI. So uh, in the middle, we can see the neurons uh, laying on the uh, the image with neuron on it, and you can select neuron uh, and see the see what, what's the signal of this neuron. You can also see the background. What's the background of this video? So. For this video, we choose two backgrounds, but you can also set the number of backgrounds as you wish. And if, if you think that it contains too many uh, false positive neurons, you can uh, raise the threshold. For example, I don't want to signal to noise ratio to be too low. I want it to be 10. And you can see that fewer neurons are selected. So you can also play with other uh, parameters. For example, now I want 0 0.9 fewer. And on the left bottom, you can change the spatial footprint of the neuron that's showing, and you can change the contrast of the background. So for the for the right part, on the on the top right, uh, you, you can see what the neuron it's look like, and on the right bottom, you can manually select which neurons you want. For example, I think all of them are good. I can add group and now it's in the accepted. And if I think this neuron, uh, this neuron looks not good, I can remove it from accepted list. Now it's in the rejected. And finally, we can save the object. Either in HDF5 or we can save it into NWB, let's say. And we can save the results. Uh, so I think uh, that's basically I want to show you guys uh, the pipeline. It's it's communication with NWB and the GUI. So thank you, Chang Jia. Uh, so I. I, I, I don't know if there are other questions. Uh, there was a question about the, the color. For, for now, the color is just random. Uh, I think it would be ideal yeah, in the future to, yeah, to, to color code uh, representing either information about the neurons or maybe some quality measures or just optimize the color so that neighboring neurons can be easily separated. Is there any other question? Ben, if there are no questions, we would be done.